Behind me is the headquarters of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. This building behind me is the result of the conspiracy in 1910 to start the Federal Reserve Bank. The book by G. Edward Griffin called The Creature from Jekyll Island details the whole process of how it came about and that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. The book tells the story how Nelson Aldrich, a senator from Rhode Island as well as the heads of the biggest banks in New York, got together on a small island called Jekyll Island in Georgia to conspire to start the Federal Reserve. So the people involved were Nelson Aldrich, the senator who was the head of the National Monetary Commission, Abraham Piat Andrew, who was the Assistant Secretary to the United States Treasury, Frank Vanderlip, who was the president of the National City Bank, which is now known as Citibank, Henry P. Davison, who was a senior partner at J.P. Morgan, Charles D. Norton, who was the president of J.P. Morgan First National Bank, Benjamin Strong, the head of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company, also became the first head of the Federal Reserve Bank, and Paul M. Warburg, a partner in Kuhn, Loeb & Company, who was a German who was an actual representative for the Rothschild banking dynasty in England and France, and his brother Max Warburg actually became the head of the Reichsbank in Germany in the 1930s. It is said that Daddy Warbucks in uh, Little Orphan Annie is actually based on Paul Warburg. So a small group of very connected people were able to basically take over the control of the money in America and make Americans a lot more poorer while making themselves and their banking buddies a lot more richer at the expense of U.S. taxpayers. And to show you what a small world it is, you have the Federal Reserve Building here, and right across the street, this building here is one Chase Manhattan Plaza. What's the importance of that? Well, Senator Nelson Aldrich, his son-in-law, happened to be John D. Rockefeller Jr. Rockefeller's son, David Rockefeller, is the one who built this building right here. So the Federal Reserve Vault is sitting on bedrock some 50 feet down from the street level, and it's in this end of the building, just like the vault that's in this end of the building, and it's been said that there is actually a connecting tunnel between the two of them. And so because of that, there's been a lot of speculation over the years that maybe uh, J.P. Morgan was moving metals back and forth that maybe they didn't own or they were borrowing and lending out to other people or something like that. But those rumors, whether they were true or not, are no longer an issue because J.P. Morgan has moved out of this building and some Chinese investment firm, Fosun, has now bought it. Now, the Fed was created in 1913, and this building says that it was started in 1914. So not even one year of being in existence did they start to build this headquarters here. But this conspiracy to start the Fed actually started in 1910. Let's go see where it started. So while the headquarters for the New York Federal Reserve is across the river there in Lower Manhattan, the conspiracy to start the Federal Reserve and trick American people into thinking that this is beneficial to them started across the river over here at the Central Railroad Terminal in Jersey City, New Jersey. So this is the train station where Nelson Aldrich had his own personal luxury train car and they would attach it to normal passenger trains to get where they're going back then. To get an idea of what the Aldrich train car might have looked like, here is a look at the John Ringling's personal train car from the Ringling Brothers Circus. These cars were very elaborate inside and out. As you can see, a lot of really nice woodwork and all kinds of details to it. These cars were very luxurious and they were like the limousines or private jets of the time. So on a cold winter night in November 1910 is when he planned this trip and he told all the other people that were going on this trip to only use their first names uh, from here on in and if they run into each other on the way here pretend that they don't know each other they're trying to do this 
very inconspicuously. And the reason is these people were all known as the heads of the biggest banks. If they were seen together, press would be very suspicious and think that something is going on. And of course it was. And here's a little look inside the train station. Of course, it's seen better days, but this was a very big train station back in the day. It is now a museum in Liberty State Park. Now, how did Nelson Aldrich have this much power to put these people together and plan this conspiracy? Well, he wasn't just a senator from Rhode Island. He was a business associate of J.P. Morgan with investments in banking, manufacturing, and utilities as well. So it is said that those seven people on the train represented about a quarter of the wealth in the whole world at the time. So this small group of people actually had the power to manipulate and shape and influence the economic lives of not only Americans, but people all over the world who continue to suck up these dollars that are printed out of thin air. Now the whole cover for this trip was that these bankers were going on a duck hunting trip to Jekyll Island. And it is said that not only did Nelson Aldrich not hunt, but he didn't know one end of a gun from the other end. But still, the bankers brought with them shotguns and hunting gear to make it look like that's what they were actually doing. So as the train took off at 10 o'clock at night from the station, it pulled out a little bit and then backed up to hook up Aldrich's train car. So the other passengers didn't even know who was riding on the back of this train. And they continued on to Raleigh, North Carolina, then Atlanta, then Savannah, then Brunswick, Georgia. The Aldrich train stopped here in the small town of Brunswick, Georgia. In front of the train stop was the fancy Oglethorpe Hotel, where many of the elite would stop on their way to Jekyll Island. Names like J.P. Morgan, Joseph Pulitzer, William Vanderbilt, and William Rockefeller. And close to the train station and hotel was also a harbor where they can quietly slip away to Jekyll Island and avoid public attention. And here's a look at what the area around Jekyll Island looked like as we head over this bridge that obviously did not exist back in 1910. So the Aldrich train car ended up in Brunswick, Georgia, and from there they all got off the train and took a boat over here to Jekyll Island, and they were staying behind me at the Jekyll Island Club Hotel. Now this staff knew the faces of a lot of these bankers, so what they did is they gave them vacation. This was during around Thanksgiving time in 1910, and so they got rid of all the employees that would recognize somebody and brought a whole new crew of new employees in. And even so, they were still only using their first names between everybody so that nobody would remember any kind of last names or anything like that to leak to the press. So what's the big deal with all this secrecy? So what if these bankers got together and wrote this bill? What's the big deal? Well, Frank Vanderlip, the president of Citibank, what is now Citibank, wrote that if it was publicly exposed that our group wrote a banking bill, that bill would have no chance of getting passed in Congress. Basically like the wolves and the sheep voting on what to eat for dinner. So this plan for a central bank in the U.S. was not the first. From 1690 to 1764, Massachusetts used fiat money to finance its military raids against the French colony in Quebec. In 1775, the colonial monetary unit called the Continental was valued at $1 in gold. By 1778, it was exchanged for just 25 cents. And by 1779, just four years later, it was worth less than a penny and stopped circulating completely because it was worthless. And that is when George Washington famously quoted that a wagon full of continentals will barely buy a wagon full of provisions. That's also where the quote, not worth a continental came from. And the first central bank called the Bank of North America was in 1781 before the constitution was even drafted. Now this bank was modeled on the Bank of England and it did have to hold some gold and silver so it wasn't completely fiat. 
although they were not given the right to issue money. The banknotes were not forced on the people as legal tender, and when the charter came up for renewal, it did not get renewed. So that was the end of that for the time being. The second central bank is the one that most people are familiar with. It was submitted by Alexander Hamilton to Congress in 1790. Hamilton was an aide to Robert Morris, who was the founder of that previous North American bank. And oddly enough, Hamilton was a supporter of a sound currency during the Constitutional Convention. And of course, Thomas Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State at the time, was strongly opposed to a central bank. And he said a private bank issuing public currency is a greater menace to Americans than a standing army. He also said we must not let our leaders load us with perpetual debt. <laughs> if he could just see us now. So in 1791, Congress approved a 20-year charter and Thomas Jefferson fought it and ultimately was able to not renew it, but there was a very big fight. I'm not gonna get into that. So now back to the people here that were planning the new central bank in 1910. So what were some of their goals? One of their main goals was to stop the growing influence of small rival banks, especially in farming and mining areas where the New York banks didn't have a lot of influence. They also wanted to make the money supply more elastic to reverse private capital formation. So they didn't want people investing in things with their own money. They wanted to loan it out of thin air and get the interest on it. So they wanted to pool all the reserves of all the banks in the country together and have them follow the same loan to deposit ratios so that they could protect at least some of them from a bank run and have a reserve to help bail them out if one does occur. And the quiet part that they didn't want to advertise is to make sure that should all of the banks collapse, they make sure that the taxpayers foot the bill and not the actual bank owners. That is very important. So they were going to do all this and at the same time try to convince Congress and the public that their plan was really for the public good. So how do they do that? Number one, don't call it a cartel or a monopoly or even a bank. Just call it a reserve. Like, what the hell is that? I don't know, but it's federal, it's a reserve, it sounds governmental, so it's easier for the people to swallow that way. So by not calling it a private bank, they're making it seem like it is actually a government agency, which it is not. Also, they wanted to establish regional branches to make it look like it is not being all controlled by the banks in New York City. And by the way, this room behind me that is currently being used as a conference by some financial firm is where they all signed off on the finished draft of their Federal Reserve Bill. And as with anything that they try to pass to the public that is detrimental to them, they start off with a very conservative version first, kind of the camel's nose in the tent kind of thing, and then once it gets passed, they add and add to it all the bad things that they wanted from the beginning. Think Patriot Act, central bank digital currencies, COVID mandates, all of that kind of thing. And so they also use previous panics as saying that this bill is a solution to that so it will never happen again. So it uses the public's outrage of previous panics and say, once we get this, all our problems are over with. And another thing that they did that they continue to use is kind of a influencer, social proof, whatever you want to call it. In those days, they used all kinds of professors from colleges and they gave them money. And of course, they came out and gave their professional opinion on what a great plan this was and things like that. But on the flip side, they got some of these very bankers that were actually creating this bill to come out against it so that when the public says oh look the bankers don't like this new bill it must be bad for them and good for the people and so that's how they kind of reverse uno people's psychology into being for or against something and if you don't think that happens today just the other day neil kashkari 
the Fed president from Minnesota came out and said, what? He said, I'm against CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. We don't need them. What's the difference? We have Venmo and all this kind of stuff. So CBDCs are not even needed. Do you really think he went off script from his handlers and uh, came out against CBDCs if they wanted him to be for it? No, of course not. He came out against it just as a false opposition. And so expect to see a few more of these uh, big finance people, you know, maybe Paul Krugman or somebody will come out against it and and then after, you know, some debate and some Congress hearings and some other people, they're going to say, well, we looked at it and uh, we decided it's for the best to bring it in anyway. Now, just like they start with the conservative version first for central bank digital currencies, they'll say something like, no, no, we would never uh, put a, a time limit on the money. Like, it won't force you to spend it or the money expires or something like that. Or we would never tie it to a social credit score. Or we would never cut anybody off for their political views or something like that. And that's all they say to get it passed. And then once it's passed, they creep, creep, creep and add these things to it. And so although they did finalize an agreement on what this central bank would look like, it was basically like the Bank of England. And the thing is, this came together in 1910. However, it did not get signed into law until 1913. So Taft was in office when they put this together. However, he was not fully on board with this, whereas their guy, Woodrow Wilson from Princeton, who came out in favor of this beforehand and so uh, the powers that be the rockefellers and jp morgan and those type of people made him governor of new jersey and the next step was president taft was very popular and so what did they do they got teddy roosevelt to jump into the race teddy roosevelt was already president earlier so he was also a republican so they got him to go onto a different party and what happened was he split the ticket with Taft and so they got Woodrow Wilson in who was very much for this bill and to show how sneaky they are they didn't want to show that they were helping Woodrow Wilson win so they continued to give money to Taft and Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson of course and so Woodrow Wilson only won with like 42 percent of the vote so they successfully split that vote if it was just Taft running he probably would have gotten way more than 50 percent between him and Teddy Roosevelt's votes that he took away from him so even though Woodrow Wilson won he could not sign that bill because the bill had Nelson Aldrich's name on there who was a Republican and who lost his Senate seat and so they don't want to sign anything that those bad Republicans did so what did they do they just basically rewrote the bill in <laughs> in different words doing the same exact thing and put the Federal Reserve Act on it and now it was palpable for Woodrow Wilson to sign it but before that happened they had to market it in the right way kind of like a product launch so Paul Warburg went all around the country doing speeches on reform and he wrote a whole bunch of articles for all kinds of newspapers including an 11 part series for the new york times in addition to that they also gave five million dollars to various schools like princeton harvard and the university of chicago to create a special education fund they also funded the national citizens league funded by the banks and controlled by Paul Warburg, a kind of fake grassroots concerned citizens group seeking banking reform. <laughs> oh, you want banking reform? I just so happen to have this bill ready for you right here. And so the Federal Reserve Act was passed on Christmas Eve 1913 to stop any of these 1907 type panics from happening again. Of course, there was a crash in 1921, 1929, the Great Depression, recessions in 1953, 57, 69, 75, 81, and the 1987 Black Monday crash, as well as the internet bubble and the great financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Add to that that the value of a dollar from 1913 till now has lost about 98% of its value. 
So this is the Federal Reserve Room where they all agreed on this bill and signed it. So I can imagine them sitting here around the fire, smoking a cigar, talking about how rich they're going to get once they get this bill passed through Congress. So why is the Federal Reserve so good for the bankers and so bad for the people? Because they have a 2% target inflation rate. Basically what they're saying is, we could steal 2% of your money every year without you really noticing it, but when inflation starts to kick up like it has recently to 6, 7, 8%, people really start to notice it. But think about this. If everybody just had gold or silver, let's say, you had 100 ounces of gold in your house, for them to take their 2% a year, they would have to send the Fed presidents to everyone in their region knocking on the door saying, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm from the Federal Reserve. I'm here to take uh, your 2%, so you have 100 gold coins. I'm going to need two of those right now. And if you're dumb enough to give it to them, they're going to come back for other things. So as soon as you give them those two coins, they're going to come back and say, Zelensky has his eye on this really nice mansion in Miami. And so we're going to need a few more gold coins for you to help him out with that. And if you give that, they're going to keep coming back for things that you would never, ever agree to fund in the first place. Things like a $50,000 trash can on a military airplane, or the old $600 hammer from the 80s, or uh, $800 toilet seat, or something like that. They are basically forcing you to waste money, money that you would not agree to give up if they came around collecting for these things on a specific case-by-case -case basis. Things like a few million dollars to see how frogs on MDMA ecstasy react. So imagine if the government had to come to you every time they needed to fund something and you can decide whether it is worthwhile or not. Uh, that would put an end to our debt and our spending real quick. But the reality is the Federal Reserve doesn't want that, number one, and the government definitely doesn't want that because that's how they get their kickbacks and bribes through overpaying for things and giving pork projects to all kinds of people that eventually kick back to them either through a job, a speech, a book, a consulting job, or even a painting. <laughs> so guys, don't ever think that one day the government or the Federal Reserve is just going to say, you know what, we really ruined the currency so bad, we're just going to go back to gold and silver. And everybody that held gold and silver will be rich and will be poor with this paper money. <laughs> no, they will drive paper money to zero if they have to, to keep their power and their wealth and their control of the banking system and of people. So guys, I hope you like this look at the conspiracy to start the Federal Reserve Bank right here on Jekyll Island, Georgia. And there is even a connection between one of these bankers and the campaign to get women to start smoking cigarettes. If you want to see that story, check it out right here.